Welcome back after the break. Well, Sajid, moving on to our next story, Nikki Haley is back in limelight again. Well, first we had her last week that she's coming up with her memoir, which is going to hit the stands in 2012. And now she's back in headlines again for her, uh, you know, she actually listed herself as a white during, you know, 2001, during the voter registration. Well, yeah, you know, uh, Nikki Haley's father, who's, uh, Nikki Haley, of course, is the governor of South Carolina. Uh, she's a Punjabi by origin. Her parents, her father, in fact, you know, still sports a turban. And uh, there's no question to, in anybody's mind that she's brown. And this happened 10 years ago. Nikki Haley is now 39 years old. So this happened even though she was not that young. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, she was a business, she comes from a business family. Her, uh, you know, her parents had set up a, a small shop which, and she used to do bookkeeping for that shop uh, in her teen years. And she grew on to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, she served the assembly there and then went on to be governor. Uh, so I don't know, you know, the, the she hasn't issued a statement to this as yet. The Democrats have like, you know, really right. gone after her uh, with, after this incident. And I guess like, you know, after the whole Burder incident where the, you know, Republican Party really got on to President Barack Obama, questioned his, uh, you know, origin of birth. The, the, this is something like, you know, interesting that the same thing should be happening to a member of the Republican Party. And remember that Haley is one of the contenders to be... Uh, 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 to be a pick for the vice presidential slot in the 2012 elections. Right. She's a rising star in the Republican circles. So this campaign is also directed not only towards uh, hitting out at the Republican Party, but it's also trying to undermine one of the rising stars. Correct. And also, you know, trying to make it a level playing field as far as origin is concerned and questions of race and, you know, birth, they all come into play here. Especially Democrats are, I think, totally after her for this. Especially, you know, the state Democratic Party chairman, Dick Harpotillion. Uh, I think, you know, he's totally against this. He's just totally taking advantage of this new headline. Well, what he's saying up. is that, you know, this is something that she has been indulging in a lot. When right. it really suits she, her, she comes on TV and, uh, you know, she espouses her, you know, Indian origin roots. And right. of course, that for various fundraisers all over the country, you know, of all parts of the country, the Indian American community had supported her, you know, done fundraisers. But then the question emerges is how much has she really done for the Indian American community? So, in, so one can question whether, you know, she denies her, you know, brown roots. Uh, she was actually born Nimrata Randhawa. Now, the Nikki Haley is a, you know, far removed from that name of Nimrata Randhawa. And of course, South Carolina is one of the bastions of the South, you know, the South, like where the white supremacists were there. And, you know, it is uh, remarkable that a woman, uh, you know, it's, it's like a double whammy for the, you know, for the old male bastion there, the old male uh, white bastion that a woman should become governor right. of the state. And also she is not white. Right. So that's like, you know, two factors there. <laughs> Absolutely. First being a woman <laughs> and then, you know, also not being, being of white. ethnic origin. So that, that also <laughs> Indian. So it's like, you know, so. I guess, you know, that's why a lot of people are taking advantage of this little, you know. Well, thing. it all adds spice to her memoir, which is coming out, you know, and next fascinating year. Fascinating political we can, I'm sure, you know, there's always time for a lot of insertions to be done, even at the last minute. Now her publishers will have a lot of time to actually get into this incident also and play it up. You know, it is bound to be interesting reading. So I'm sure it's going to be in her memoir also. Absolutely. <laughs> interesting. So it really is, you know, it's a fascinating political journey that this lady is having. So, um, moving on to our next story, it's uh, another hard-hitting story. I mean, it seems like discrimination, it's just not ending, you know, I mean, it keeps on going on somewhere, somewhere, even though, you know, we say, you know, in the United States, discrimination doesn't exist and, you know, people are treated equally. But doesn't, I mean, I don't think so if it's really happening that way after, you know, going over the story that we have. It's actually uh, of a Sikh family. Um, the story says that uh, U.S. Department of Justice investigation was spurred by discovery of emails from sheriff commanders before Garcia took office that disparaged religious, racial, and ethnic groups. The probe was also prompted by the treatment of member of a Sikh family detained in late 2008 after calling deputies to their home to investigate a burglary. So basically, there's a Sikh family calling, you know, cops to come over to see, you know, there's a burglary in their house and they actually pay for this. I mean, they're actually, you well, know, Well, it happened in 2008, very, you know, right. uh, the, the, you know, the interesting thing is that the, 
uh, a Sikh family went home in Harris County, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, in the suburbs of Houston. Right. And uh, when they went there, they found that uh, their house was ransacked. The house right. was burgled and there were a lot of jewelry and money missing. They make a call to the cops. The cops come there and they see a kirpan hanging from this, uh, you know, from the Sikh woman who had made the call. And they panic and they arrest her, arrest the other members of the family who are present including her mother who was 60 years old. So they thought like this is some kind of a trap to, you know, for the entire Sikh family to attack the police officers who reached the spot. And interestingly, you know, 2008 was also the year where this very, uh, you know, interesting incident of Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. happened. You know, he's one of the preeminent African-American academics uh, scholars in this country. He had called the cops after, uh, you know, he couldn't enter the house. And when the cops reached there, they thought he was breaking in. Just they saw a black person standing in, right. a, in a wealthy neighborhood outside of, you know, in, in the Boston suburbs. And they thought this guy is actually trying to break him. Uh, there was a confrontation. The police arrested him. And this uh, eventually, there was a white policeman and there was a lot of talk of racial discrimination erupted into a big kind of controversy all over the country. And pr finally, President Barack Obama invited uh, both the aggrieved professor and also the, uh, you know, the white police officer who had arrested him to the White House for a beer meet, you know. So they all had a beer and talked about it. Wow. But of course, uh, the, you know, the, when the, it happens against the Sikh community or the Indian American community, you know, the, against a Muslim uh, American, uh, it doesn't, you know, reach that, uh, you know, gain that much of attention. But this is one of those stories here where the county is actually trying to make amends. What they have actually tried to do here is that, you know, they have uh, got an expert to monitor the counties, you know, how they, uh, be, uh, you know, deal with these kind of affairs. And what the, now the agreement requires is the department, uh, you know, will review the use of force and internal affairs procedures as well as develop diversity and cross-cultural awareness, uh, which is, is in Harris important. County yeah. in Texas. And the agreement also calls for a written report uh, after an eight-month review, which will serve as an outline to improve the handling of complaints against deputies from the public, how internal investigations are conducted, and the training of officers who do them. And the sheriff, you know, and the, you know, the Garcia, he actually, after this incident took place in 2008, he tried to make amends by going to a local Gurdwara, covering his head and taking off his shoes and going and praying there. Uh, he also agreed to invite Sikh and Muslim religious leaders to participate in the department's faith leaders meeting and create a citizen advisory council to meet every two months to foster communication with the public. So this is something that's a very welcome step, uh, you know, the county is trying to make amends to. And especially in Texas, one of those areas where the Indian American population has doubled since the last right. census, uh, you know, right. and there are parts of Irving and Houston. Houston especially has a, a large number of Pakistani Americans are also there. They're trying to make sure that the, you know, the minorities are protected, their religious beliefs are, you know, taken into account. And, uh, you know, trying also to understand how the community works, you know, they, that police officers should go undergo training and not panic when they see a kirpan. Well, yeah, and I also think, I mean, you know, the law enforcement over there should be, you know, more aware of the religion, you know, of, you know, like Sikh community or any minority community. I think they should have a better knowledge. Like in this case, kirpan. Kirpan is actually more like a religious thing you know it's not a weapon i mean even though it's a knife but the purpose of that is you know for religious purposes you know so um kirpan i mean you know it's actually one of those things that you know seek uh, people actually wear it around their neck uh, you know around their body or neck right and you know it's actually not to harm anyone it, it is why one of the five religious... tenets of uh, Sikhism, correct, like, you know, correct. religious beliefs and you know if i think if cops you know had better knowledge of this then you know this thing wouldn't happen. So my main concern is that they need to teach these law enforcement officers about different religions, and especially while they're on their training. I think this thing. But but have. I think this this is also emanating. You know, Harris County is one of those areas where a lot of trouble has taken place in the past. Right. Even in 2008, you know, the former sheriff there, the Tommy Thomas, he was forced to apologize to local Muslim leaders. You know, after emails from his staff were released that contained racial and you know kind of religious and ethnic slurs. One from the department's jail commander used the name of Prophet Muhammad, you know, to make a joke about eating pork. You know, so right. this was something which incensed the Muslim community there, and finally the sheriff had to apologize. And now his successor is trying to make amends. He's trying to make the county a better place for the minorities to live there and also feel free to, you know, to practice their religious beliefs. So we hope that it's going to work, and you know they'll have better understanding of religion, and you know 
the whole process so things like that don't happen. Well, Sajid, moving on to our next story. Four major Indian American civic and professional organizations in United States with a substantial membership have joined together to campaign with U.S. administration seeking relief on penalties stipulated by U.S. tax rules on foreign bank accounts. So enlighten us about this. Well, you know, we talked about this last week also. I had the opportunity to interview two top Correct. tax experts from Citroen right. Cooper Mann. And, you know, the, now what has happened is that four of the biggest Indian American organizations have formed an umbrella body. And they had sent a letter to uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner but they didn't get any and response. Also Hillary Clinton. And also Hillary Clinton. Uh, and now they have written a letter to President Barack Obama. Right. And, uh, you know, they have a set of demands. Uh, but these four organizations, let me just tell you who they are. This is the Gopio chairman. The letter was written by the Gopio chairman, Inder Singh. Gopio, of course, is a, you know, the global organization of people of Indian origin. Right. The NFI, National Federation of Indian Americans, President Lal Motwani, the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Uh, President Dr. Sunita Kanumori and AHOA, the Asian American Hotel Association, uh, uh, you know, Chairman Hemant Patel. So they have asked for a set of demands uh, so that it gives more time for the, you know, for the community to respond to this uh, looming tax deadline, which is August 31st, where the Indian uh, uh, Indians have to disclose all their bank assets offshore. So I think uh, it's going to help, you know, people might, you know, because of all this effort, might have better understanding of the entire process of IRS. Well, they need the time because, you know, and according to, uh, you know, Dr. Thomas Abraham, whom I spoke to earlier today, uh, and he is, uh, you know, the founding president of Gopio, uh, there are these set of demands. And again, like this is, you know, has been part of the letter which has been sent to President uh, Barack Obama. It requests that the penalties of 25% foreign bank and financial accounts, the FBAR penalty on assets of law, abiding citizens should be eliminated. They also want that the IRS deadline should be extended to December 31st of 2012 instead of the August 31st August of this year. They also request that the 20% accuracy penalty on undeclared taxes be substantially reduced to those who did not knowingly miss the filing deadlines. You know, uh, you know the representative from uh, Citroen Cooper Mann had actually given an example where a million dollars kept in a bank account in India, once you dis disclose that to the IRS, the entire, you know, the tax on it, the penalties and all that will actually result in a uh, total uh, tax penalty here will result in 41% of that amount going away, which, uh, you know, 41.8% to be precise. So $418,000 out of a million dollars kept in an account in India would have to be paid back to the IRS. Wow. You know, this is something which is a big concern right. because if you don't file, then you, uh, what eventually happens is that you face jail term. So, Jay, the very interesting story. The New Jersey may see its first Indian American judge after defense attorney Sohail Muhammad became one of our governor Chris Christie's seven nominees for a superior court position last week. Interesting. Now we're going to have a first Indian American judge. It couldn't happen to a better person. Sohail Muhammad, you know, is likely that he is going to become a judge. He'll become only the second, you know, Muslim American judge in the state of New Jersey. Uh, but, you know, he shot into fame after the work he did, you know, following the 9-11 uh, attacks, mm -hmm. you know, where he defended more than 30 detainees, Correct. all of them of Muslim origin, which the U.S. authorities, you know, swooped down and took into uh, detention. He uh, defended them very uh, vigorously and also, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, got him a lot of national headlines all over the country. And Governor Chris Christie has been very impressed with him. You know, uh, he has been... Uh, Christie has been a regular guest, uh, you know, at the uh, American Muslim Union, for which uh, you know Sohail Mohammed is a member of, and uh, he has been uh, Christie has been going to the annual Ramadan dinner, and he has been full of praise for the work that uh, Mohammed has been doing. And even with that, um, New York Times has also reported that Mohammed has helped arrange a law enforcement job fair at Patterson Mosque in which young Muslims were encouraged to apply for the job with law enforcement agency. That's another interesting well, so, uh, you know, uh, Fede, I just want to uh, quickly go into his background. Uh, uh, Mohammed graduated in 1988 with a degree in electrical engineering right. from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He worked uh, full-time after that for, a, uh, for GEC, the Marconi Electronic Systems. And at the same time, he earned his law degree at the Seton Hall University's School of Law. Now, he's also an executive board member of the New Jersey Bar Association. He's got impeccable credentials, and somebody who knows the community very well has worked, uh, you know, very 
hard uh, to uphold their rights and I think it's an excellent pick. I think he actually had a tough life, you know, he actually went to night school for finishing up the law school, so, you know, I guess hard work pays off. Well, Sajid, uh, it is now time for a break, but before going to the break, why don't you tell us about the interview that you just did? Well, you know, uh, this is this absolutely interesting study that has come from the Center for Work-Life Policy. It's a non-profit think tank which is based in New York City. And I had a chance to sit down with uh, Ripa Rashid, who is the executive vice president of that organization. They have come out with a study which says that the Asian Americans are not, don't really make great leaders. They don't really, they hit a bamboo ceiling. They are not able to rise to the top because of subtle racial discrimination at work. Well, Sajid, so seems like an interesting interview that you just had, which we're going to see right after the break. Well, it is now time for a short break. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.